no one is going to say it's easy to parse the XCOM game series and its virtual Xeno brood of side titles and spiritual successors, spirited prequels, questionable sequels, and fits and starts. And the less people mention XCOM the Bureau, the less children are thrown into the sun trying to make amends for it. The XCOM series started out simple enough, a turn-based title that had you taken various branches of militaristic forces against aliens that were slowly taking over the world, with an overarching hub world and turn-based battles for missions, all in the fiction originally created by Julian Gollop. Now, Julian has returned to the fold with his team at Snapshot Games to try again, this time with Phoenix Point, a game not unlike XCOM in many ways, but with a different worldview, mythos, and some attempts at new gameplay techniques, and of course, a new battle system in place so that Phoenix Point doesn't look like so many other games in the genre where 99% chance to hit somehow equals 75, and every bad guy's suddenly like this, and you're all bang, oh fuck, bang, 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 oh crap, bang, what the hell, bang, bang, sweet Jesus, just let me hit somebody. Let's see how Snapshot Games has done. As always, I'm Carrick, this is ACG, and it's my continuing mission to bring you reviews that aren't too minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. Phoenix Point will be out tomorrow on the Epic Game Store as well as Microsoft Store for 40 bucks, but it is included in the PC version of Microsoft's Game Pass. And of course, it's coming to consoles later. As always, if you like the video, I'd love for you to subscribe, hit the notification button so you see all the updates. Let's begin. Graphically, the turn-based genre has always been all over the place for me, especially when it comes to artistic representation. This might be a reflection of the number of smaller independent studios that try something new. Or it may just be the colorful antics of Rabbids vs. Mario, or the anthropomorphism of Mutant Year Zero and its realism mixed with Howard the Duck-like caricatures that really lets this genre in particular spread its wings for me. Even the aforementioned XCOM and its expansion War of the Chosen, which can be argued are the high-rent cousins of the equation. Admittedly, both games look a bit like they were filmed at a Prince concert with smoke machines and colored lighting and particle effects spat out like Prince just tossed all the doves into a chipper shredder and as they cried, he recorded the feathers flying out. Phoenix Point tries its best to offer something unique to the genre, but it's a subtle approach and it might actually be missed by a lot of gamers. One of the first things you will notice if you're watching is the changing alien designs as they morph depending on what's worked in the past against you in other battles. While we see tiered enemies in other games, there's something unique about seeing them adjust to what's worked in the past both offensively and defensively and then take that to the battlefield. I really dug it. Now, when it comes to the overall look of the game, it's not to XCOM standards. It's got destructible terrain folding and collapsing around you. So one moment a building with two doors suddenly looks like it was rebuilt by an architect who was the world's biggest Swiss cheese fan. Those parts are shattered everywhere and the walls and the roof is collapsing. All the locations are built on themed templates and then procedurally put together to offer a unique location for every battle. And overall, while the maps aren't particularly large, this actually does work with clutter and choke points meeting you in the ruins of old shacks and junkyard styled locations and then cathedral like three story buildings in some of the newer locales all of which you can destroy parts of. But there are some random low detail textures that creep in here and there, depending on where you are. Now, most people won't play the game zoomed into the maximum level anyway, but if you like staring down at your team like a kid burning ants with a magnifying glass, you may notice some ugly. For a title in this price range, though, I think animations look good, with up-close attacking characters leaping into the air and alien thawing a bunch of enemies into submission, leaping out a window, being flung around by explosions, or being killed and sliding off the side of a building into the fire at their feet. I did notice the game is a bit light on the effects overall. While much of it is probably due to the physics that play out, it does give Phoenix Point a bit of a Spartan look, where even a pieced out shantytown on the wrong side of old age looks a bit less interesting than I think it could. One part I loved in the game was recruiting some of the characters that have sadly succumbed to the infection themselves. Look at this guy. He absolutely has to be designed from many faces in He-Man. Probably not, but yeah, whatever. I still think so. Unfortunately, one place where Phoenix really feels like it stumbles is the HUD. Not really stumbles exactly, but never gets moving at all, then still finds a way to fall on its own chair and cut its ankle on an old beer can every time you're looking for any kind of data. It's never really that informative, and the status updates are rough looking. When you surprise drop a grenade onto a toboggan-sized head of an enemy, the random stats that just blurred out onto the screen almost look like placeholders. It needs more polish here, and more thought to the presentation. That is really not as informative as it should be. Now, when it comes to performance, the game runs about where you would expect, with 4K 60fps completely doable with a 2080 Ti, with the settings mixed between high and low. I would have liked to have seen more graphical settings, though there isn't a ton here, with you able to dial it any way you want with texture detail, shaders, shadows, and distance, as well as some side effects that you can turn on and off. I still would have liked the ability to dial it in a little bit more. And that brings us to gameplay and a bit about the story. What would happen 
if seafood got its revenge, if Finding Nemo turned hard R and that R stood for revenge and stood for Rossum, which is sort of like awesome, but a lot of revenge mixed in. When you think about it, it's pretty gross just stepping into a red lobster, which is gross enough on its own, and watching a series of fat horkers smashing down entire droves of seafood into their throat pipes, grunting and never realizing that at one time the seafood on that table was a singing, dancing troupe of undersea extras in a Pixar movie. An ecological disaster has temperatures skyrocketing in the world, causing the polar ice caps to melt, and at some point a long dormant virus comes out of the ice and while being studied by scientists, subtly influences the world around it, in particular sea life. And this sea life ends up floating around around in a biological mist, a little bit like an evil clam chowder, and it starts to creep around the world and offers a staging ground for all these creatures to attack humanity. Add into that one of the creepiest Pied Piper situations ever, where humans become attracted to the sea and just start wading into it, and then probably fuck a bunch of crabs, and end up shambling out again with pincered enemies crawling around old decrepit buildings, guns held in hands that still look just a bit too human for my taste. I like the alien design and the way the atmosphere fit with that. Now, one of the things about this is you play as a new inductee to the research base itself known as Phoenix Point, where those you can recruit, trick, spy on, or take command of will stage whatever last stand humanity can. What I liked here is that Phoenix Point is not relegated to the reaction to the virus itself, but was in place since World War II as a research and science group that failed. So when you arrive and take it back over, you feel like a separate faction from all the rest. I really did enjoy that part of the story. Phoenix Point has three overall sections for gameplay. The Geoscape, which is the world globe, and something any XCOM fan will instantly be familiar with. Use this to travel, make overall decisions, watch the spread of the mist, and try to pick strategic points to fight back against the virus and those infected, while also constantly juggling the complete jackasses who run the other factions. The Disciples of Anu, the Syndrome, and New Jericho. Now, the Anu have embraced the mist and its changes and use it to fight back. The Syndrome, which surprisingly enough are the most normal of the groups, embrace the desire to fix the world while also admitting everything's still fucked. And then there's New Jericho, and yes, you can automatically tell by their name, these are numbnuts, militaristic, xenophobic, and so up to their balls in the belief that the good old days were better that they think anyone who doesn't look exactly or act exactly like them is a bad guy. Lastly, along the top of the screen, you can see your salvage from the different work you do, your tech points, and your food, all of which are needed to create or keep what you have created alive. The second section of the game is within the geoscape for sure, but it's at the bottom a bit separated, and that's your control tabs. First, there's the base building. You have a power allotment built up by how many generators you have and then various different buildings you can create, all that offer perks like giving experience to characters that rest in them, research to faster healing, and others. You can't really customize the location of the items during the base building. Spots on a grid open up and you throw whatever you want there, watching to make sure you don't go over the power allotment. This is all expected. What is cool here is that you can go Go to other factions bases and you can raid their areas spy trade with them and so forth depending on how much they like you it's not done in a large overview kind of spreadsheet way like a lot of games and this actually helps to give each base and group a bit of a feel of their own Next up is research. Here you don't have very much at first because research is tied to meeting other factions and either stealing their stuff, fighting enemies, or working with them so much that they agree to help you out. You can find their tech, allowing you to research it backwards, and then you're able to create it. Next up is manufacturing, which is exactly what it sounds like, with you having the ability to scrap stuff you don't need and create items you do. Some items are automatically created, like ammo, where a new gun can take a bit, and I like this. It keeps that spot busy enough with you going in and out and topping off items you need and removing others all in one screen. Next up is diplomacy, which is exactly what you think it is, showing you the different factions that like or dislike you and allowing for you to interact with them. And lastly, the redundantly named Phoenixpedia, which collects all the terms for the game. But despite all the hard work you may do, flying place to place, exploring, scanning, and of course building and researching, at some point you're going to do combat, and that's the last section. Whenever the combat ability trips, you pick a group of soldiers and then you go into war with various classes like sniper and assault, each one offering starting abilities that are unique. When you land, you're given objectives on the upper left corner of the screen, and from there, you end up moving out. Each character has four action points that you can spend on different activities like moving and shooting, and the game has a none, half, and full cover system, so keeping against the walls can protect you from fire. 
When you battle in the game, it's your entire team, then the enemy's team going. There's no real initiative to speak of. You can tab between each character to have a go with whichever one you want in whichever order. Now, while I said there are many mission types, in the end, most of them actually boil down to just killing everyone else on the map and keeping your guys alive as much as possible. Each character has three skills, strength, willpower, and speed, with strength handling things like total health, willpower dictating use of special skills in the field, and the fact that you may just end up running away in fear, and speed, which handles how many squares you can move, and a couple others. As you level up, you get points to upgrade your characters, including skills that are based on the class you choose. For an example, an assault character might choose War Cry, which is an area effect that reduces enemies' action points for the next turn, as they basically shit themselves in fear when a six foot six armored up super soldier yells out a Dragon Ball scream in mid battle. And a lot of these sound like exactly what you expect. However, the moment you shoot someone, things get a little bit more interesting. You can basically just choose to unload in the enemy's direction, or you can actually go into a free aiming system like Fallout's VATS and pick different body parts to take out, which becomes hyper important. No more percentages reading out on the screen. Also, every bullet is modeled, so hitting with just one bullet may occur, but those bullets can pass over the enemies and knock down parts of the game world, which is pretty cool when you think about it. I really enjoyed the hell out of the system. For instance, taking the pot shot works, but due to the way the bullets are modeled, if you're lazy and just take the pot shot, you can sometimes end up taking out half the scenery with your character, and of course, friendly fire is on. But zoom into the vats and you can choose not only which limb or body part to hit, but see all the stats that hitting them could affect, like taking out an enemy with headshots that even if you don't kill them might remove a special power that allows them to take control of your teammates with siren-like songs. Also, there are bosses or mini bosses that are horrors to take down if you are not paying attention and shooting their weapons out of their hands or taking out specific points is the de facto way to win. Lastly, the evolving enemies. I love this. It is a bit difficult to tell when or if it was happening, but lo and behold, if you're seeing success against an enemy with far off weapons later on, I started to see enemies that seemed to move faster and farther and stealth more than the prior ones, meaning getting a beat on one of their 50 eye laden brows without some crabber pinching the shit out of me started to become very difficult. I would have liked a bit more feedback on the system, though, even if it was one of the characters screaming something like, what the hell is that every time we met a new creature? Regardless of that, I think it is a very cool idea, even from a purely atmospheric standpoint. Now, if you succeed, you're then shuttled back into your waiting vehicle and you get a readout from the status of your characters. If they're hurt, their experience points gained, and if they can go up a level. If they are hurt, you need to go back to one of your bases, of which you can get more as the game progresses, and rest either in the airplane, if you have a building that extends healing to that, or place them in the base itself. And depending on the difficulty, this can be a bit laid back to batshit insane. All the while, the other factions are also going about all their places, stealing resources and having their own fights, sometimes even calling you for help when they get attacked. If the infected begin winning battles, the counter for the worldwide infection rate rises, and if it reaches 100%, well, it's game over. But it's also going to be game over a couple other ways too, so be aware of that. For example... I like to check the difficulty in all the levels, and even on easy, I got a couple team wipes a bit later in the game. That was on easy. If you go into a battle without proper prep, from not healing somebody up fully to not having the proper weapons to mistakenly thinking you can take on a section with a major enemy. For instance, the first time you end up facing off against one of these Alaskan king crab car-sized slug things with a big shell on its back, you think to yourself, no worries, I'm just going to aim for its legs, which makes complete sense until that sucker starts ejaculating slugs all over the ground that crawl up to your characters, explode, and poison you. All the while, your bullets tear down half the buildings around them, but just bounce off their shell. This isn't something brand new, but I like to hear. For instance, when a base is being attacked, you only have that particular amount of time to help them. So I rushed it a couple times, which is proof positive you always need to recruit as often as possible in the game to make sure that you have a lot of people who can go to battle. And I ended up landing with a couple slightly hurt characters. The next thing I know, some shambling thing is nagging me like a YouTube dating video, and the guy turned around and blasted his best friends in the face with a shotgun shell. But what was cool here is they didn't just go aggressive. They'll actually heal any other mesmerized characters on your team. And if the enemy you're fighting has a skill for countering when it's attacked, they all counter. That's right. So you're left with blasting Billy and Ted and Melissa into a watermelon sized bits or just running around hoping it wears off or taking out the infected itself, which results in that counterattack. And I dig that. It's lethal and it feels right. It feels like they're actually controlled. And the fact that they do more than just meat punch you into oblivion feels more organic. Unnaturally, a game like this that has bugs in the game shouldn't have them in the gameplay, but it does. 
First, the game conveniently forgot I was dead a couple times, resulting in me being asked what I wanted to do as two dead teammates and being left with cerebrally challenging questions of end turn and, well, yeah, just end the turn, over and over and over again as the enemies promptly ignored me and walked over my corpse 12 times. I also had one crash, and I did have one time where the game just really didn't want to save. Luckily, there was an autosave there. Phoenix Point goes out and it tries to add a couple different gameplay situations that we're not quite expecting, and I would say in some areas it works, and in some it doesn't. Nevertheless, for me, I did like the story, and I did like those altering and changing and morphing enemies. I think that that's a really good idea, and I'd love to see more games try something like that, even if, at times, it was a little too subtle to even notice until I was looking very closely. And that brings us to sound music and voice. It seems to be the defining pattern of your history. Fall, then rise again. I wonder if this points to an underlying weakness or an underlying strength. Moving out. And sound is up first, especially in a game like this when you're switching between that far off camera and then zooming straight into the over the shoulder smoke wagon action moments. A game like this needs to nail the sound effects, whether environmental or primary, the rattle of guns, the reflexive flinch causing explosions of grenades. It all needs to happen and be filtered in so that the far away view offers an almost detached clinical soundscape to it. And then the closer you zoom in, the more your oh shit nerve needs to be tickled. That really doesn't happen a ton here. The games have a nice detailed long tail off of effect that helps you feel like the spaces are a bit wider, but I do wish that they had a lot more detail to them, especially secondary and tertiary mechanical bits being represented. The first time you fire off a sniper rifle, it's going to sound a little like royalty-free sample number three is being played. This is more noticeable when you go into the free zoom, which is the game's pseudo-vat style, as I explained before. Explosions are about the same. Now, I do like the wet slurpy sounds of the movement of some of the enemies, and due to the line of sight style gameplay, it can be a bit creepy when one's sliding over the top of a building, and yeah, sliding is actually probably the right word for it, and it sounds like a wet sock filled with two pounds of grease that someone just threw against a wall. You can hear them rattling and moving around the walls and behind the foundations, and that really works. Environmentally, like many other parts of Phoenix Point, the game can present itself as a bit lean. You can be neck deep in a battle with three alien sea slug looking monstrosities, and then when you zoom out to look at everything, Thing, it's sort of silent. Environmental sound effects like crickets and bats do play out, but usually the game world is a bit muted, giving the locations a static feeling that could have been avoided. I would say it's not great, but it does what it sets out to do. And that brings us to music. I remember the first time I downloaded the top five synth VSTs for Ableton from some websites list and then just leaned on the keyboard and said, yep, that's good enough. All kidding aside, it does sound like that at first. However, the longer I listen, the more I notice something. There's this haunting and weird and dark and eclectic mix of tunes and half tunes that don't play out here with any respect for your expectations. There's nothing battle ready here. There's nothing stirring. There's no expected moments. But the more I listen to it, the more I actually like that. It's like a bunch of depressed sounds met up and started sprinting together. And then occasionally they all line up when everybody takes a perfect picture and you sit back and you go, I noticed that then it's gone again. It's discordant and it's different and it works well with some of the sound effects to bring this weird world to life that's mostly human, but also, yeah, just a bit fucked and a bit alien all at the same time. Each game's soundtrack is unique and the way in which it's audibly reflecting the game world can be important during musical interludes or a menu screen or even a level up choice screen. Phoenix Point has its own way of doing things and it's not an easy sell, but it's something I found myself buying into the more I listened. So I'd say I dig it. It's not exactly listenable in the normal sense, and you won't be seeing a Phoenix Point, the official soundtrack, anytime soon. But that's okay. And that brings us to voice. First, let's get this out of the way. One of the faction and its leader's thoughts on the world are like the gaming equivalent of sitting down with an interview with a Papa John's founder. And don't worry, the day of reckoning will come kind of shit. Most of the time, though, it's informational as you're getting the deets on some secret group behind the scenes, and none of it carries the creeping gravitas of the leaders who speak to you in the XCOM games, who somehow with just the sound of their voice elicited enough mystery to fill an entire season of X-Files. But it works. Other than that, it's okay. There's no real standouts. It's just overall solid for this budget. And that brings us to Fun Factor. 
Fun factors of the juice. It's what causes you to sit up late at night, chest covered in Doritos, fumbling with your keyboard, trying to figure out how to work through that one last level before you drearily stumble off to your own bed. So when a game mixes XCOM with being attacked by every single mistreated crab leg from the Red Lobster, it's hard not to be interested. And I didn't really get into this game until about midpoint. It might be because little things are off-putting, like the HUD, or maybe it's just that it takes that long for the game to really open up. I'm not saying it was like cracking my nuts with a slingshot the first couple hours or anything, but it took a while to really dive into. It took getting more locations. It took filling out my base, getting more airships, and diving deeper into the story before whatever happened happened, and I ended up clicking with it and really ended up buying into the fiction. It's not a slow start. I'm not going to go there. I would just say it's a bit more on the tepid side. It's the Diet Cola of starts. It looks the same, somewhat tastes the same, but there is a little bit missing. Despite liking it a lot, I will say there were long periods of times where it felt a bit more repetitive than other titles in its sphere. It does a couple things that are unique, but other than the aiming system, most are hidden behind, at the very least, a couple hours of gameplay. So as you guys know, I rate games on a buy, wait for sale, rent, or never touch it again rating system. And on PC, rent is replaced with deep, deep sale if that's the rating I give it. Since we have so many ways to get this title, including Game Pass, I'm going to discuss this as a purchase title for its $40. And I would say it's probably a wait for a sale. It needs some patches, it is a bit repetitive, and that fun takes a while to get into, and it is a bit lean. However, all that being said, it is an enjoyable narrative. I did like a lot of the gameplay. I just feel like it needs a bit of shoring up. Now, if you have the ability to get this on Game Pass, well, we're not even going to go there. Just go ahead and just grab it and download it and play it anyway. I mean, it's no real big loss for you. It is missing multiplayer, which I think is another ding against it, even if it was some kind of sandbox multiplayer. So anyway, that's it for me. I hope you guys liked the video. If you did, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down. Make sure to check out all the other reviews and videos that are coming. And of course, if you're here for reviews, that's great. But if you want to see the podcast, that'll be on Twitch. I'll try to upload it here if I don't continue getting claimed. And you'll be seeing some new videos this year. You'll see a lot of diversification on my point because you got to protect yourself from YouTube just absolutely losing its nuts and completely going insane, which is what they've done. So I would love for you guys to subscribe if you get the chance. You can also come to Patreon and become a patron for ACG. It's one of the coolest discords in the world. You always have a chance to jump on a podcast with us, maybe discuss a couple games, maybe give some ideas of reviews or titles you want to be seen. And it helps me continue to give you guys reviews that aren't two minutes long or filled with sponsored bullcrap. And I buy a code for every single game I get, even if the developer gives me one. Peace out and enjoy the rest of your week.